Dr. Miller Meeks for five minutes of questioning. I thank you, Mr. Chairman, and I thank the witnesses for testifying before the subcommittee here today. In 2022, 62% um, of Iowa's total electricity net generation came from wind, the largest power share in any state. Iowa was the second largest wind producer in the nation behind Texas, and that capacity is expected to increase. We also have a variety of renewables and 50% of our energy is from renewables. However, critical minerals are essential components of renewable technologies. Mr. Strat, as you stated in your testimony, there are often no substitutes for these materials, and China controls about 70% of the global processing capacity for those, these minerals, as well as you stated, 47% of the um, mining uh, rights. We know that security and supply chains comes from having diverse options and inputs from multiple sources, but China, a nation who already controls the majority of processing and critical minerals investment, has benefited from these investments in mining operations since the passage of the IRA, while domestic cobalt mines are forced to suspend operations. You, the United States' strength, competitiveness, and economic dominance came about because we were willing to utilize our own abundant natural resources. In your view, how can we curb the direct benefit to China without jeopardizing the security of our supply chain while we work to reduce our dependence? Thank you for the question. And it's very interesting that you started with wind because as I was preparing for this hearing, I was thinking about things that I encounter when trying to permit a mine. Oftentimes, a company is trying to permit a mine in an area that has been designated for solar development. The federal government has said, this should be used for solar. More and more, there are plans popping up that prioritize wind, and for good reason. As you point out, some parts of the country are great places for wind-generated uh, wind energy. If we know where the critical materials are in the U.S., and we have a list saying that America needs more and has a shortage, why aren't we going to the maps and the data that says the mines are here? These are the areas that should be prioritized for development. Thank you. I'm going to deviate a little bit uh, because I want to get this question in. Um, Dr. Michaud Foss, we have highlighted some of the more immediate challenges to our critical mineral supply chain and ways Congress and the administration can begin to work to fortify access to those resources. I'm going to pivot for a moment because I'd like to focus some of my time on seabed mining. This is an issue that has not received as much attention but could hold some promise. What's the state of seabed mining for critical minerals today, and are you optimistic that American companies will have an opportunity to compete for this resource? China has a long-standing interest in deep sea mining, and I believe China is positioning itself to be the world leader in this technology to recover minerals from the sea floor. Thank you for putting that on the table. Um, what we have on the seabed is a huge resource, and it, it has tremendous benefits in purity. So for all of the concern about environmental uh, mitigation, environmental impacts of, of extracting seabed minerals, you're actually saving on the processing side because you're, 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 you're removing almost pure metal. It's, 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 a, it's a very, very interesting resource to consider. Um, unfortunately, the International Seabed Authority, which is the keeper of the keys on rulemaking, permitting um, for seabed development, was not able to reach an agreement. Um, there are, there's, there's a lot of unhappiness about uh, whether or not to extract um, from seabed resources. Uh, the Europeans have proposed a ban. There are various issues like that. There are uh, projects underway in territorial waters. Um, those governments are moving forward, Cook Islands, uh, Solomon, and so on. There are American companies with a lot of technology kit around this, and I'm happy to say that we have a lot of them in Houston um, because the overlap between the offshore oil and gas businesses and uh, marine mining are very, very robust and very lively. They're, con they're convinced, we've looked at it, it we can do this safely. Um, and because of the benefits on the processing side, it's very alluring, but it's a tough one to talk about. We are seeing some movement in support of it, though. Thank you. And then, Mr. Vincent, I think you've mentioned that uh, the uh, IEA estimates the demand for key minerals such as lithium, cobalt, copper, rare earth elements will grow by 40 times the current demand by 2040, yet the United States produces less than 2% of global lithium supply. What can Montana, Montana and other parts of the U.S. do to fill the domestic upstream uh, supply uh, and then midstream supply chain? 
Uh, thank you for the question. Uh, lithium is one of the few uh, minerals that we don't have a lot of in Montana, but domestically we have lots of it. I believe the congress, congressman from California alluded to the opportunity they have there. I mean, it, it just goes back to what we've been talking about. Better coordination, more certain permitting, and extending the incentives that go for the upper end of the value chain starting from the ground up. Uh, thank you very much. Sounds like we need to do more mining and process in the U.S. We would do it more environmentally friendly and wouldn't use child labor. Thank you.